Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and I'm the former director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. Uh, as I've said before, I intend to keep on with my weekly economic outlook, at, of which this is apparently the 99th, more or less consecutive uh, one since the pandemic started, but only so long as Martina Garcia, who now runs the center, thinks that it's useful um, since she and I disagree on quite a lot, notably on European issues. I, I don't know how long that will be, but for the moment, I'll plod on. I'm actually in the United States at the moment and will be for a couple of weeks. I haven't really yet had time to absorb anything of the current zeitgeist over here, and I can't therefore offer any particularly meaningful insights into US thinking, not even through the Sunday talk shows though I, I note that some sort of down-the-line progressive Democrats that I was talking to yesterday are all for bombing the bejesus out of Putin. War makes strange bedfellows. Uh, but be before we get on to Ukraine, as I fear that we must, I think it's worth noting today's, that's Monday's, bizarre spectacle in the Negev desert, uh, where U.S. Secretary of State Blinken is orchestrating a high-level near summit involving the foreign ministers of Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and a palpably reluctant Egypt. The ostensible reason for this is to cobble together a united front against um, uh, against Iran, I guess, uh, though without Saudi Arabia, I think that's probably pretty meaningless. What it certainly does do is demonstrate, at least to me, just how hard the US is willing to twist the arms of its notional allies in the region in order to maintain the impression that Israel's policy of normalizing its uh, relations with the Arab neighbors is working. It may be uh, but I fear that the Arab governments involved are getting ahead of the Arab street on this issue and that it could be dangerous. Of course, Israel, sorry, Egypt is um, in a particularly vulnerable position because it is the world's number one importer of wheat. And it has uh, been hit, therefore, extra hard by the Ukraine war. I guess it'll do pretty much anything to get US help with food imports. Still, at the same time, the talks in Vienna uh, on the uh, on on the renewal of the JCPOA uh, on Iran's nuclear program have clearly not been going well. And if they break down completely, which is clearly a possibility now, we could have a second crisis on our hands with the potential to go nuclear. After all, Iran is close to having the capacity to build a nuclear weapon, even if the only way it could deliver it to Tel Aviv would be via DHL. So I guess any, any, any branch has to be explored. Okay, enough of that. What of Ukraine? Well, it's obviously still the number one geopolitical problem, and increasingly, the number one economic issue as well, simply because it makes all the other problems that we face that much more intractable. Now, I don't want to bang on about this uh, and about how it might all end up. I've been doing that for a few weeks. So I do note that we now seem to be moving to an agreement on some sort of partition of the country. If so, in my opinion, that would be sensible, though it wouldn't play well with Hawks in Washington or indeed with Zelensky, but it certainly beats the plausible alternative of a nuclear war. Instead, let me focus on the most important economic and financial developments in the crisis, at least over the last week or so. In particular, I think it's worth emphasizing, first of all, the relief when it turned out that Russia had in fact managed to pay the $117 million that it were due on two foreign exchange denominated bond issues, and that it had managed to pay in hard currencies and not, as uh, many people had expected, in rubles. Fine. The problem is that according to the BIS, total Western bank exposure to Russia is about $121 billion. So this is not an issue that is going to go away, but at least we won round one second. 
I want to flag the decision of the uh, central bank governor, Elena Nabiulina, to double Russian interest rates to 20% or more, coupled with Putin's threat that unfriendly countries will be required to pay for their oil and gas imports in rubles. That has given the ruble a pretty significant boost. Pre-invasion, it was trading at around 83 rubles to the dollar. It then fell as low as 123, and it's now back to around 100, 101 rubles to the dollar. However, that's the official rate. God only knows what the market rate, the street rate at the present time is. I kind of imagine people are converting anything they possibly can into hard currency. Third is the forecast by the Washington-based IIF, the Institute of International Finance, that Russia's GDP will fall 15% this year. Considering that uh, Russia's central bank insists that GDP was up 6.6% year on year in January, which I'm a bit skeptical about, that would be a major turnaround. GDP has all sorts of issues, definitional issues, but a drop of that magnitude is huge. Unfortunately, it's depressingly plausible. Somewhere close to 400 foreign companies have already closed their operations in Russia. Shortages of imported goods are clearly showing up in the shops at the present time, and urban unemployment is bound to rise sharply, and it's urban un unemployment that Putin must worry about. Fourth was, I think, the decision by the Russian authorities to reflag the 50% of commercial uh, aircraft which are operating in Russia on, on foreign-owned leases um, as Russian. This is a clear breach of international law, and I think that it's one that will do great damage to the international aircraft leasing industry, which is actually enormous, particularly in, of all countries, in Ireland. I can see Irish Keystone cops trying to seize Russian planes every time they venture outside domestic airspace. Uh, I can also see a whole industry in panic mode at the present time. And fifth is the latest list of sanctions which was imposed last week, uh, imposed after Biden's visit to Europe on 380 Duma members on the CEO of Sparebank, though the bank itself, I note, is still not on the sanctions list, and on a range of defense companies. At the same time, the G7 closed a loophole in the existing sanctions regime by banning all gold dealings with Russia, which it appeared had been a loophole and a way for foreign firms to circumvent the ban on dollar-denominated deals. There is no doubt, in my opinion, that these are the toughest economic sanctions ever imposed on an advanced economy, and they are having an impact. Reports that Ms. Nabiolina actually tried to resign when they were imposed, and that Anatoly Chubais, the original privatization czar, had actually done so, are, I think, indicative of the seriousness of these sanctions. But sanctions, one has to accept, have a very spotty record, and they do tend to hit the wrong people. Still, I'm very much of the opinion that sanctions, imperfect though they may be, beat the hell out of nuclear war, so let's give them a go. They're certainly less damaging to the global economy than a nuclear war would be. With regard to that, however, for what seems like the hundredth consecutive week, one has to begin by emphasizing two big problems. First, the relentless rise in inflation, which is being caused by a combination of cost push inflation, demand pull inflation, and what is new, I think, about this latest burst of inflation, a contraction of global supply chains caused partly by the COVID pandemic and partly by the impact of both war and the sanctions themselves. And second, the real fear that as a result, both of the problems that the global economy faces and the response of central banks, we are facing a serious risk of global recession. I shouldn't allow myself to forget about COVID either. 
indeed Beijing's muddled, in my opinion, muddle-headed decision this weekend to shut down Shanghai's financial district because of its because its disastrous zero COVID strategy has left most of its citizens with no natural immunity to the latest variants, is going to make a big problem even worse, though I guess. I suppose as, if there's a silver lining, it is that Hong Kong may be a beneficiary, at least in the short term. Add to all that, of course, the background fear in the minds of every macroeconomist that the global equity bubble is about to go pop. Well, <laughs> what can I say? It will one day, but there is really not much sign that that day is yet nigh. Indeed, the week before last, the Dow Jones was up 5.4%, the S&P, the broader S&P 500 was up 6.2%, the Zetrodax in Germany was up 5.8%, and our own FTSE 100 was up 3.5%. Boy. Last week, the band kept on playing, albeit I think the music was a little quieter and a little, just a little bit more discordant. Week on week, the Dow, for instance, in the US was up just 0.3%, though the S&P was up 1.8%. And the FTSE here in the, UK, well, here in the UK, I'm in the US, but the FTSE in the U UK was up 1.1%. Perhaps significantly, the Zetrodax was off 0.7%, reflecting the German market's unique vulnerability to supply chain problems caused by the incident, the conflict, the war in Ukraine. I never know what to say about stock markets other than buy the dip, but I do know that Goldman Sachs began last week by warning that the S&P is 10% overvalued and that a fall is likely. It will come, um, as I should add, it already has in bond markets. There, I think last week was truly significant, spectacular, the yield on the two-year US Treasury note, for instance, rose week on week from 1.94% to 2.28. The benchmark 10-year Treasury yield rose from 2.15 to 2.48. And the 30-year, the long bond yield, rose from 2.43 to 2.59. Same in Europe, notably in Germany, where the 10-year Bund yield jumped from 37 basis points to 59 basis points. Even Japan has joined the party. Last week, the 10-year JGB rate rose from 218 to 225, and that prompted the Bank of Japan to pledge this morning unlimited bond purchases to drive the rate back down. We'll see if that works. These, whatever, these are big moves, and they will have cost bond funds and the pensioners who invest in them a lot of money. Given the pressure on central banks to jack up interest rates and to do so in increments of at least half a point, not 25 basis points, bond prices can only go one way down. So what does all that say about prospects for either inflation or growth? Well, there wasn't much new uh, last week as far as inflation is concerned, though there's a lot due this week, uh, in particular in the US, where the PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, will be published. Still, it was reported last week that producer prices in Germany were up 25.9% year on year in February. It was also reported that the PPI, the producer price index in Spain, was up 40.7% year on year. And that in the Eurozone as a whole, S&P's cost index for March hit an all-time record, jumping from 74.8 to 81.6. It was also reported that in the UK, uh, the notionally independent office of bureau, well, I say notionally independent, I guess it is formally independent office of budget responsibility, conceded that inflation will probably be at least 9% by the end of this year. It's currently 6.2% with the retail price index, the RPI, at 8.2% and the input PPI running at almost 15%. Inflation is even becoming an issue in Japan, where the Tokyo CPI was up 0.8% month on month in March. 
Ooh. No wonder, therefore, that more and more commentators are coming to the conclusion that central banks' response so far has been pretty derisory, pushing official rates up, official interest rates up to, say, 75 basis points or even two and a half percent when prices are rising at close to double digit rates is not going to do much to dampen inflation. However, it may tip the global economy into recession. Now, I, I think this is a much trickier area, and it's not one where I have a, a, a clear view. First of all, the labor markets, at least the labor markets in the West, are still exceptionally tight. Last week, for instance, it was reported that in the United States, first-time jobless claims fell again in the latest week to just 187,000, which is the lowest total, the lowest weekly total since 1969. As for the UK, well, the coming interest increase in national insurance contributions, even with the raised threshold that Rishi Sunak announced last week, may begin to cool the market down. But the labour market in the UK is also clearly very hot indeed. Second, the most recent PMIs, the Purchasing Managers Institute, it, it, Purchasing Managers Indices, now published incidentally by S&P Global, that, which bought IHS market for $39 billion. Wow. Uh, the most recent PMIs, uh, which were starting to be released last week, are pretty strong. Looking at the composite PMI readings, for instance, the US PMI rose last month from oh, rose uh, last month from 55.9 to 58.5, and Japan's PMI rose from 45.3 to 49.3. However, the UK PMI actually eased a bit from 59.9, which is very strong, to 59.7, and Germany's composite reading fell more sharply from 55.6 to 54.6. In general, though, the PMIs weren't too bad, and they don't support the thesis that the global economy is about to fall off a cliff. However, there are other economic releases that are a bit more worrying. In the US, for instance, it was also reported last week that the Chicago Fed's National Activity Index fell in February from 0.5. 59 to 0.51, which is a significant drop, that new home sales fell 2% in February, that durable goods orders were off 2.2% or 2.7% ex-defense, and that the final Michigan Confidence Index for March, which the market tends to focus on quite seriously, fell from 62.8 to 59.4%. There were a few positive indicators as well, but one thing that is clear in the US is that the housing market is starting to look very wobbly and higher mortgage rates won't help. On your side of the Atlantic, the picture is similar. Not everything is pointing in the same direction, but I think negatives are starting to outweigh the positives. In particular, at the Eurozone level, the Consumer Confidence Index, the forward-looking Consumer Confidence Index, slumped in March from minus 8.8 .8 to minus 18.7. And in Germany, the highly influential IFO survey for March was also equally grim. The Business Climate Index fell from 98.5 to 90.8. The Current Conditions Index fell from 98.6 to 97. And most significant of all, because it is forward-looking, the expectations index fell from 98.4 to 85.1. That's a big drop. Actually, Germany wasn't unique. France's business confidence index also fell from 112 to 106, and Italy's confidence index fell from 112.9 to 110.3, all pointing in the same direction. There just isn't that much good news around. As for the UK, well, we were all focused last week on Rishi Sunak's spring statement, but it does seem to me that that was pretty small beer. It was clearly deflationary at the margin, but I couldn't get as excited as, as some of the other comments, some of the commentators say at the FT. Uh, he and Boris Johnson 
were clearly holding back in order to have some goodies to offer the credulous masses ahead of the next election. Which, whichever one is prime minister at the time, he will need all the help that he will get, that he can get. Other than the, the budget, the spring budget, however, I noted the fall in the CBI's distributive trade survey from 14 to 9, though the industrial trend survey surprisingly was up from 20 to 26. I, I note also the fall in GFK's consumer confidence index for March, a forward-looking indicator from minus 26, not very good in the first place, to minus 31. I note also a 41% year-on-year fall in UK automobile production in February. Are we still making cars? And I note a 0.3% fall in the volume of retail sales in February. So thanks to the miracle of inflation, in money terms, they were actually up 0.7%. Well, elsewhere, it was reported last week that Japan's index of leading indicators fell from 103.7 to 102.5, although that was in January, so we may just be seeing starting to see the impact of that on real economic activity. Where does all of this leave us? Well, according to my market gurus like uh, BlackRock's Larry Fink and uh, PIMCO's former bond strategist Bill Gross, not in a good place. Jay Powell at the Fed seems acutely conscious of the dilemma that he faces. He's hoping for a soft landing for the US economy, but he doesn't seem so convinced that he can achieve it. And not many of his colleagues or indeed outside observers are even as confident as he is. What else? Well, I think it's worth pointing out that the energy crisis precipitated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine is still far from over. Indeed, both marker crudes in the oil market were up another seven or eight percent last week, leaving Whitty, West Texas Intermediate, the American marker, at around 113 bucks a barrel, and Brent at 117. Wow. Gasoline prices are also rising on both sides of the Atlantic at a record clip, and a 5p per litre cut in fuel duty will very quickly be swallowed up. Meanwhile, Traders are warning of a diesel shortage, and that will play havoc with already stretched supply chains on both sides of the Atlantic. Not much good news there, I'm afraid. There are, of course, patches for all this. I, I note, for instance, the interview over the weekend that the Canadian oil minister gave in which he pretty much pleaded with the Biden administration to buy more Canadian oil. Well, some of it is pretty nasty stuff. <clears throat> but certainly they have unused capacity. And Venezuela also uh, stands ready to help the beleaguered Americans, but the environmental lobby is still holding the line on both of these. Indeed, in the US, I think the big news in the uh, energy front, on the energy front last week, was the 534-page uh, proposal from the Securities and Exchange Commission that would require all US-listed companies to disclose on a regular basis their greenhouse gas emissions and their exposure to climate-related risks, including, in some cases, so-called scope three risks, either there's a risk up or down the supply chain. The general feeling seems to be that <laughs> Gary Gensler, who's relatively new at the SEC, has overreached himself with these, uh, with this monstrous volume, but the Zeitgeist may still well be with, may well still be with him. The other big development of last week was, I guess, the agreement uh, by the European Parliament and the European Council under the co-decision process on a final digital markets act that would hit so-called gatekeeper platforms like Google, Amazon, Meta, and Microsoft, and would have them force them to open up to third parties. I really think this is important, but I also think the platforms will fight long and hard and that the Biden administration will go to bat for them. After all, with few exceptions, they are major donors to the Democratic Party and indeed to Biden's own political campaigns. Linked to that, of course, is the preliminary deal that was also announced last week on a transatlantic data privacy framework permitting, so it is said, EU data to be stored 
on facilities on US soil. That's probably a victory for common sense in a digital world, but it may not be enough to win big tech support for the Digital Markets Act, which is anathema to, to the uh, American tech giants. Finally, a word on politics. A April 10th, not next week, but the week after, sees the first round of voting in the French presidential elections. There's no doubt whatsoever that Macron will win, and that he will win another five-year term in the April 24 runoff. But what is interesting is the sudden surge in popularity for the old Trotskyite bruiser Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, who's now polling around 14%, only just behind Marine Le Pen. Mélenchon's appeal is to the young, to the working class, and to the unemployed, and it's not dissimilar to the appeal of, remember him, Jeremy Corbyn. His policies include cutting the retirement age to 60, tends to be very popular, uh, providing a universal minimum income of 1,400 euro a month, not bad, uh, a wealth tax, and a new, less presidential, less Jupiterian constitution for France. There's no chance he'll win, but it is yet, I think, more evidence that the political pendulum has swung sharply to the left. Actually, I'm reading and reviewing a book um, by Thomas Piketty on precisely this subject. It's called A Brief History of Equality. I never managed to read his monumental opus on capitalism, but it's all here in 250 pages. Scares the hell out of me. Um, in addition, I guess this, uh, this coming week, Biden will send his fiscal 2022-23 budget proposal to Congress. Remember, it's only a, uh, a proposal, but it is an important one, and it will include a 4% increase in defence spending. I hope that by next week I'll have something more interesting to say about the US. There's certainly a lot going on over here. In the meantime, I think the big economic releases of this week will be the US non-farm payrolls for March, which are expected to be up a massive 678,000, which I find a bit implausible. More inflation data from the EU, particularly the harmonized inflation data, and the economic sentiment for the Eurozone as a whole, which is an important forward-looking indicator. As far as equity markets are concerned, I'm clearly a skeptic, but uh, US defense stocks look awfully much like a no-brainer to me in the current political environment. Fill your boots, what can I say? Thanks, and I hope to see you again next week. Many thanks. <laughs>